I have already been enjoying talking to Paula Boddington and uh, we've been laughing far too much, but I wanna share her wisdom with all the rest of you. She is a philosopher of AI and also an artist. And uh, today we're gonna share a little bit of our own work and talk about creativity and AI. And I'm gonna let Paula start with talking about however she wants to approach this. And then later on, I'll share some of my stuff too. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Karen, for that. And, and, and I would say to anybody watching or listening is that I wouldn't actually describe myself as an artist, but I do. I do love, I really love art. I really love art. And uh, I've, I've never done as much as I'd intended to. But one of the things I wanted to sh share with you is that um, I've always tried, I've, one of the things I've been really interested in is exploring how you can use art to help communicate ideas in, in um, philosophy, but also in, in how you teach ethics about how I mean, a lot of concepts in philosophy are sometimes they can be just quite difficult to grasp. Um, and sometimes there's a way in which we need to try to communicate to students. You can focus too much on words and on and on theories, um, really. So, I mean, so, for example, just to illustrate this before I before I start with showing you some of the stuff I've noticed. So I, I spent quite a long time. I moved from Oxford University a couple of years ago, so I spent quite a long time teaching undergraduates at Oxford. And was always impressed. I mean, on the whole, they're pretty bright. I mean, not surprisingly, because it's quite hard to get in. But one of the things that really struck me, because I taught, um, uh, I taught ethics there for a long time. So one of the things I've always tried to do in ethics is to encourage students to think about how it all applies to you no know, their real life, or to think of different cases. Because one of the one of the ways in which thought can go wrong in philosophy generally, or especially in ethics, is by thinking of too narrow set of examples or by not being able to understand how some theoretical idea applies to a, a, to a case. So I've been, been really impressed at how well, even first year students at Oxford can read really difficult texts. And they have, they've got this really punishing program of churning out essay, essays week after week after week. They can read really difficult texts and then cobble together a really sort of pretty well argued essay. And then I'd ask him in the tutorial, well, could you think of another example of that? No, no. <laughs> Just blank. It's, it's really difficult to apply it to their to, um, to their lives. Um, so, but I've also one of the, so I'm actually going to start off. The thing I'm going to start off by showing you is something that doesn't quite relate to that. But I've always had this on my massively long to-do list. Um, I've 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 really wanted to explore how you might use illustrations to help illustrate philosophical texts. Mm -hmm. And so, a really long time ago, actually, we lived in we lived in Australia for a while. I can't remember if I mentioned to it. I used to go to some classes at the Canberra School of Art and I went to a class on the art of illustration and as a result at, the, at, at sort of the end of that I um, did an illustration for a short snippet from Descartes so that was the first thing I was going to going to sh going to show you mm -hmm. and then what, what else I've got to, to, is to is some images I tried to use to try to um, in my for my students last autumn term in a course in AI ethics, so, some images I use to try to sort of accompany oh, the lecture. That sounds like really exciting. I can hardly wait to see. Yeah, <laughs> especially the Descartes. How do you illustrate Descartes? <laughs> well, I, I picked a passage, but I could remember, I might have mentioned last time that I used to miss a lot of school and go off to the local library and read philosophy. And one of the books I picked up, well, I picked some books up, which I had the sense to take back. I took out when I was 15, I think I took out Sartre's Being and Nothingness. I'd read the first paragraph and took it home, <laughs> took it back to the library. But I did, I did read um, Descartes, which is actually really readable. But there's a, some passages I remember really struggling with what on earth he was talking about. And I picked one of those passages for, for this um, exercise. So I'll, I'll just share the screen and hope it works again. Well, while you're doing the share screen, I'll have to say I had the same experience with Sartre in college. Yeah. We were supposed to read it for a class and I started to read it. And I thought, if I read this, that'll be the end of me. So I'm not going to read it. <laughs> I wasn't very smart, but I was smart enough not to read that. <laughs> yes, yes. yeah, I, was I had no idea what he was talking about. I'd read a lot of his novels when I was a teenager, which I now think are absolutely dreary and awful. But his his, his being and nothingness was just beyond me. Okay, so so this I did this as a concertina book, so which is like six pages long, mm -hmm. and it's a really famous passage from Descartes' Meditation when he's trying to argue that uh, the real knowledge that we have, the true knowledge we have of everything, is through reason, not through our senses. So just to fill this in, so Descartes is, I mean, he's often called the father of modern philosophy. Um, of course, that's going to be disputed, but you know, he's, he's often, he, he was in fact, often the first, one of the first philosophers you'd 
learn about in the first year of an introductory course. And he famously um, decided that he was going to go through a method of doubt, of trying to doubt everything that, that he knew, and came to the conclusion that we could doubt everything in our senses, and that all our knowledge is basically based on, 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 on reason. So he came up with, just to fill in the background, he came up with a famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So it's based very much on the mind. Uh, and he downplayed um, sensory knowledge. So um, this is, this is I, attempt, I remember puzzling over this short text, wondering what on earth he was talking about. So this is the illustration. Um, the first page, so it's consider the objects commonly thought to be most distinctly known, the bodies we touch and see. I will take not body in general, for these generic concepts are more often are often the more confused, but one particular body, say this wax. So it's actually interesting that even though he's a rationalist, he's saying that these general concepts are often more confusing and looking at a particular example of wax. So when I did this, I can see now when I look at it, I can see all the mistakes. So, so at the bottom, it's not right. It wasn't supposed to be um, like wonky at the bottom. Um, but I did some background research for this. I, I, I don't often do this in art, actually. I'm usually more spontaneous, but I spent a lot of time planning it out. So this is a picture of a wax in the middle. I, I was not really unhappy with it. It just looked like a lump of wax because wax is hard to draw because it's just like a little lump. I bought some wax so I could draw it. Um, and at the, at the top, so I've obviously got some images of bees there, but a little row of beehives at the top with little bees around them. Can you see them right at the top there? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I wondered just, if those were actual houses or if they were, yeah, beehives. That, that totally makes sense. So I guess in England, you have much more beautifully created beehives. Here in America, oh. they're just white boxes. <laughs> Well, no, well, I copied. I copied those. Those are just all copies from Diderot's encyclopedia. Oh, okay. So I found an entry in his in his encyclopedia about different beehives. It was an amazing different variety of beehives that they had. So, I mean, it was a bit. He's a bit later than De than Descartes, but 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 um, that's yeah. So that's the, the, the first page. So this wax. Consider this wax. It's just been extracted from the honeycomb. So onto the next page. So this is where he's trying to sh trying to illustrate trying to show that um, nothing we know from the senses is, 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 is valid in any way. So it's not completely lost the taste of a honey. So there's a, 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 a I don't know, like a fly, is that a fly or a bee tasting the, I suppose that's a fly actually tasting the honey. It retains some of the scent of the flower from which it was gathered. So I got, like tried to illustrate scent from that little flower. Its color, shape and size are manifest. It's hard, cold and easily touched and it gives out a sound if you wrap it with its knuckle. So I tried to find ways of illustrating all the different senses. So he's gone through, he's gone through all the, the five senses. So it says, in fact, it has all the properties that seem to be needed for our knowing a body with the utmost distinctness. So he's, try he's trying to show how we think we know it, but then actually it's illusory, according to him. So, but while I say this, the wax is put by the fire. If it loses the remains of the flavor, the fragrance evaporates. But that's one of my favorite bits actually, where I did the evaporate some a little O from evaporate. Is yeah. <laughs> that's supposed to be a wilted flower there. Uh, the color changes, the size increases, it becomes fluid and hot. You can hardly touch it and it will no longer give out a sound if you wrap it. So that's his. Um... That is just marvelous, Paula. That, that page is just marvelous oh, thank you. Oh, if really? you if you could do that to every philosophy book i would start reading philosophy <laughs> oh really oh thank you so much yeah well i don't know it would take so long to do the whole of a book you'd have to take out selected little pieces you'd have to I'd, i've i've mapped out when i was tidying up i start stuff and then i've just got just too much not enough time i'd mapped out a while ago i'd mapped out some passages from aristotle's nicomachean ethics but i'd like to do an illustrated version for for children, there's some really fantastic little passages in that, that that would make really, really wonderful little illustrations. Like so, there's one, like one of my favourite passages out of that book. There's so much kind of quirky stuff in it. One of my favourite passages out of that, which I think like really makes me feel as if yes, of course the ancient Greeks are just like us in many many ways. But he's talking about um, for context, he's talking about um, a. a Sort of roughly the context is of attention and his example is the sort of people who eat nuts in the theater eat most nuts when the acting is bad which I, so it really makes me laugh thinking 
the ancient Greeks said the sort of people who eat crisps noisily during the, at the theatre at the opera. <laughs> Those type of people existed in Greece. And he noticed that, you know, if the play's really good, then they don't bother to eat the nuts. But if it's terrible, they're eating nuts. <laughs> those, those sorts of things would make really, really great little illustrations, I think, because it humanizes it. Well, before you go on, I want to I wanna just drop this in here too. Um, for a few, a few times I've had a conversation with uh, uh, a therapist, a psychotherapist, I guess she is from Canada um, by the name of Annette Poisoner. And she's also a writer. Right. And um, she has, since Jordan Peterson came along, she has found his ideas so helpful with her clients. Oh, great. And um, <clears throat> Her clients have just thrived by some of them who had been depressed for years and she started using Jordan Peterson's work with them and then they're, they're healed. She doesn't need to wow. deal with them anymore. Wow. So, um, so she decided that she was going to start trying to simplify some of Jordan Peterson's writing and, uh, and write books about it. And so she's published a number of books about his work. But recently she thought, what if I start illustrating some of these ideas and try to make it more accessible for young people, you know, try to capture the younger generation. And so, you know how a lot of the millennials and the generation Z, they like to do this Zen coloring. They have these coloring books and they like to, um, well, yeah, I guess you'd just call it Zen coloring. So she started putting together these Zen coloring books with simple illustrations and quotes from Jordan Peterson's books and uh it's pretty cool <laughs> wow, I'll have to have a look at that. that's that what this kind of reminds me of um yeah, some, maybe yeah. Could, yeah maybe I could do a coloring coloring in book for a philosophy coloring in book yeah well I'll I'll try to find a link to some of her stuff and put it on the uh description so you can see it oh thanks that would be that would be really great so shall I go on to the, the last page now? yeah yep so this is this is his conclusion. So he says, is the same wax then still there? Of course it is. Nobody denies it. Nobody thinks otherwise. What well, what in this wax that was so distinctly known? Nothing that I got through the senses, for whatever fell under taste, smell, sight, touch, or hearing has now changed. Yet the wax is still there. Um, and at that illustration at the bottom of a phoenix coming out of a fire. But again, I just copied that out of Diderot's encyclopedia as well. So that, that's, that's the conclusion of this little passage. Well, it sounds like, uh, like he was the first postmodernist. <laughs> <laughs> well, his, his, con his conclusion is that therefore, he then goes on, but therefore we, what we know about it, we know through reason because we reason that it's the same wax rather than using our senses, which I, I, and I think it's a false conclusion because we know that through our senses, just because the, it's interesting, isn't it? Just because the senses have changed, but of course you've, you've also you've seen it being put in the in the fire, so you've seen the whole process. It's I think it's a failure to understand processes really, but it's yeah I think that's well. There was well, and and it's also taking an example of yes. something where everything in the world can burn up in fire, and so yeah, then yeah. so there's no meaning anywhere. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, like Jordan Peterson says, you can think that if you want to, but where does it get you, you know? Yes. It's also, it was also an interesting example because he chose the example really carefully because wax is one of the few things that that will happen to. So, but it will, but it will, well, I mean, lots of things will change if you put them in fire, obviously, but it's, it's to say the wax is still there. If you mm -hmm. put, put in a fire, you wouldn't say, um, you know, you wouldn't say I put a log of wood in the fire and yet it's still there. If it'd been burnt to nothing so he's, he's chosen the example but well he stopped at a certain point with the wax though yeah if you continue to burn the wax it'll evaporate that'll be it it's over yes 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 yeah. yeah. so well, he, chose, he chose carefully he chose to make carefully. his point <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so would you so how should we do this would you like to show would you like to share some of your stuff now or well so you said you had two aspects one was this aspect of illustrating um philosophical ideas and then what was the other side of art that you were oh right okay so so the other the other side was just um just just looking at 
you know, we were talking last time about um, technology and um, one of the things that I've tried to do, that I often try to do when I go away anywhere on my travels is instead of taking photographs is to do little sketches. So I had some of those to show you because partly illustrating, also partly I would like to maybe encourage people to do this because it really doesn't matter how, like, how good any of the sketches are. I just, I just found it a really nice way of seeing the world really, really differently if to just going around taking photograph, photograph. I mean, I do like photography as we mentioned last time, but so many, so often you see people at, you see people at tourist sites and not really looking at what they're there to see. They're just taking photographs of it and walking on. You wonder if they ever actually look at the photograph. They could just go, they could just stay at home and download photograph <laughs> and image. <laughs> well, I do find that if I spend my, my vacation taking photographs, I haven't enjoyed my vacation. And, and I used to do that. I used to take photographs all the time because I wanted, um, when I first started painting, I painted village scenes and flowers and things like that. And so I was always taking pictures when I was on vacation to have fodder for my work when I came home. Yeah. But then I didn't enjoy the vacation because I never experienced anything. I was always on the other side of a camera. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But I also, I also had put together some of the um, slides from the lectures that I did last term um, because I was teaching artificial intelligence and ethics in a course, in a course on a master's course where, well, one of, one of the issues that I had to, um, that I had to think about was the fact that some of the students on the course had done four years of philosophy before going onto the course, and some of the students had done no philosophy at all. So I had to try it. So it, some people would have done some background in ethics, in other words. Now, of course, everybody has got some background in ethics because everybody's a human being. Mm -hmm. So you've know, lived, lived a life, but in terms of the, the, the philosophy of it. So I had to try to think of, about ways of explaining a lot of basic ideas, but also trying to get students who'd looked at some things before to think about them more deeply or maybe in a different way. But then it's also, it's one of the things that I was, I had in mind to talk about last time, but we didn't have enough time because there was too much to talk about. In terms of um, creativity and thinking about ethics. So when you're, when you're teaching, when you're teaching ethics to philosophy students, um, and I've also done a lot of teaching to people in like in a more applied context. So I've taught engineering ethics to engineering students and so on. It's not as if you're not like a sort of like a, a, a preacher, a sort of sermonizing. Um, so Paula, could we, while we're just talking here, let's stop sharing screen because I, okay. I like to be able to look at you. <laughs> right now I'm just looking at the screen. Okay. There we go. Yeah, okay. okay. So, so you're teaching ethics at the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's, I suppose I can illustrate this by a conversation I had years and years and years ago when I used to work at Bristol University and a few of us were discussing ways of teaching ethics and trying to get ideas across to students. So I suppose you could divide ethics into sort of theoretical philosophical ethics and more applied ethics. So but in, in either case, it can be quite difficult to, to um, get students to really engage. And one of, the, one of the problems, of course, is when you've got undergraduate students, um, through no fault of their own, most of them have obviously haven't got much life experience, so that they don't necessarily have much to draw on. And we were sort of, there were about four of us musing on this. And have you ever had the experience of saying something and only realizing you, you say it when you, you've said it when you look at people's reactions? Because I've I heard myself say, well, you've just got to hope that something really horrible happens to them. By which, by which of course, of course I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> what I was, what I was meaning was something which would like slap them out of the sort of complacency or about a better way of, of looking at the world. So mm -hmm. it was something to sort of t turn them around. It doesn't have to be horrible, really, but you know that's that, that's kind of that's kind of what I meant. Yes, um, and it, it relates back to what I was saying a little while ago. About, this is um, what gets people in trouble on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily. There was no social media in those days and everybody just laughed. Um, well, when you're in a real conversation with real people and you say something like that, you get the immediate feedback, right? Yeah. <laughs> I crossed a line here. <laughs> well, I think my colleagues knew I didn't actually mean. Yes, yes. Mean and then that's the other thing. When you're talking to people who know you yes, and yeah. care about you, it's a, it's a different <laughs> experience, right? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes. So. So yeah, and and yeah. So I suppose I could now I could share I could share the slide. I, yeah. Unless yeah. 
I could share it again and then look and then look at some of the images. So what I'd, these are all photographs. So I'd tried to pick photographs that would um that would be there maybe kind of subliminally or maybe just to kind of like open up people's ways of thinking about it just a little bit over and above what they might have done if we were just just using words or just using standard standard illustrations. And I also actually, in the context of um, talking about AI, there's, there's grown up really quickly a sort of standard set of images about AI and about kind of like possible moral problems or ethics. So like for a standard Robocop um, image, I mean, it's changing slightly, but if you, look in the if you look in the media, anytime there's an article about AI, there'll be a picture of some, you know, some sort of awful kind of robot overlord type or something something mm -hmm. like that so which then makes us think about it in certain ways so or you know pictures of there's quite a lot of work actually uh, that people have done looking at how say images of robots so a lot of robots now actually are, are done in as women with like even like with with breasts and so on which is <laughs> absurd <laughs> but um, the ones that scare me are the ones from Boston. Is it Boston Robotics? Yeah. Boston Dynamics, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Boston Dynamics. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But but it was like. But then it makes you think about the, the issues in a certain way. So I just tried to find images that would kind of be slightly what people weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. should I like share the screen yeah. again? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So. So actually, so this is the, this is the first one. This is actually so one of the big one of the big issues that we need to look at in AI is a question of control. So the question about there's this broad set of questions around whether or not AI we are going to be able to control AI or whether AI might actually control us. So there's a, there's a set of questions. So there's a set of questions about that many people are looking at in particularly in philosophy, certain sorts of people in philosophy have, have been particularly concerned with questions about the development of superintelligence. So you may have heard of Nick Bostrom's book, which is a real bestseller. Um, I think it was just called Superintelligence, actually. I think it was on the New York Times bestseller list. That actually, in a sense, surprisingly, because it's a very technical, dense book, but he was concerned about that we might intentionally or accidentally develop a form of AI which then takes off and is able to then increase its own intelligence and then might actually then have control of us in various ways. So there's been quite a lot of concern about that. Um, there's also a concern, actually, I think, more pressing with the way in which AI already, con already controls us. So, that's, so that's, that's, that's a question about, so questions about superintelligence are often sort of illustrated in very, very futuristic ways. But this, this photograph here, this is my daughter, actually, um, a few years ago, she's about 17. And she was just, this is a mirror we had above our piano. And, it, something about the way the light was coming in through the window, she just noticed, she called me to get the camera, that the, the two sides of a mirror, the beveled sides of a mirror, were sort of like just in the right angle to put, to put like sort of little rainbows down, the right distance that she could stand there. And it looked as if the light was kind of coming into her eyes or out of her eyes. And so it just looked really, 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 I thought it looked really, really spooky. And so the reason why I chose this is because it seemed to me kind of like ambiguous about whether or not there was some kind of like mysterious light that was trying to control her or whether somehow the light was shining out of her eyes and she had some kind of like superpower. So that was, that was. Not to mention that she's incredibly beautiful. Oh, she has yeah. that look of, of a, uh, almost that look of an artificial created being because she's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. She'll be very, she'll be very she's very modest. She'll be very, very, shy to hear that but yes but it's for, but also she was just looking so because she was staring so staring so intently into the into the mirror so that's 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 kind of like and then and I, as I did in successive lectures like I did three lectures in this series so I just made it increasingly spooky <laughs> with each one well yeah and what, once you zoom in like that you see the whole rainbow effect too it's not just a in the, in the first image, it looks just like a streak of light. You don't really see the rainbow effect, but wow, yes. that's amazing. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was, yes, that was, that was, that was kind of like great, that was kind of great fun. So I probably got too many in here actually, but so actually, so another, so, when, so and related to this question of, of control, there's this, there's this fear that we are going to end up being taken over by AI 
or, or actually, I mean, I think, and I think, I personally think the greater fear is not to worry about whether we will be taken over by some super intelligent AI in the future. I think the greater worry is that we have already been taken over. We have already been taken over by our devices and by, um, so obviously they're useful. Otherwise I would never have met you or be talking to you if it weren't mm -hmm. the internet, but you know, there's, there's, a, there's a great problem of control. So, so usually this is, this is done in some kind of like ap apocalyptic, futuristic, you know, type scene. Uh, this is, um, this is, again, this is actually another trip, another trip I took with my, with my daughter when she was studying French. We had a little trip to Paris. And this is on, have you ever been to the Pompidou Centre in Paris? By any yes, uh-huh, yeah. Yes, this, this is on, um, I don't know if it's a top floor, one of, one of the sort of higher floors on the Pompidou Centre. And uh, these, I've forgotten the name of a sculptor who's done these figures. It's nothing to do with AI, but the sun was going down and this happened to be the fire exit. This is like the emergency exit. And these figures, I'm oh, sorry, I'm pointing at the screen. I always forget people can't see. So the, the figures behind it are sculptures on the roof and, we're, and then with a pigeon just behind it, which I love that the pigeon just happened to be there. And then the, the, the setting sun on the Paris skyline and the fact that there's an emergency exit and then these two figures that look like they've been through some kind of <laughs> calamity. So I, I, that's, I just picked this because again, because it has nothing to do with AI. So I was, I was just trying to, it's a way of trying to, people can really focus narrowly on AI, AI, AI. And I think when, we, when we're thinking about all the ethical and social issues around AI, we need to think about it. It's just part of, it's part of life. It's part of, in order to think about, in order to think about an eth one ethical issue, we've got to think about it in context, about how it compares to other things, different ways of thinking about it. So again, that's the reason why I chose this image, even though it's got nothing to do, it's nothing to do with computing, nothing to do with, I, I, I just kind of like really love those figures. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a ter terrific photograph. But th what came into my mind when I was looking at it and you were talking about the way we think, you know, how, how we, sometimes we, we get in a rut and we're thinking only the way that certain images have taught us to think and that an image like this takes us outside that. So the other day on Twitter, someone had posted something that I had seen before and I had actually tried it before and I knew it worked, but I tried it again. It's a, it's a negative image of a woman's face. You can kind of tell that that's what it is, although it's very um, unclear what it is, but it's a negative. So it's all, you know, everything is flipped. And then they tell you to look at this red dot on the nose and just stare at it for 30 seconds without blinking and then look at a blank wall. Yeah. And so you've done that before, right? Yes, yes. In fact, I yes. saw that same image, but we, we had, yeah. when we were kids, we had an encyclopedia that had that in it. So, so, so you do that. And when you look at the blank wall, the photograph yeah. shows up in all its glory and you can totally see this woman. Yes. But you haven't been looking at the woman. You've only been looking at this red dot in the middle. Yes. And, and this negative image that's surrounding it is just kind of coming in through your peripheral senses. And, and I think that's what something like this kind of a picture does is it redirects your attention away to something that allows those peripheral senses to open up. Yeah, that was, thanks. That was, that, that was my aim. That was my aim to try to get things ticking on along in the background, but, but in a sense to, yeah, in a sense to, it's a form of concentration, but in a sense to, to avoid too much of a narrow, a narrowing of a focus. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember what's coming next, but, oh yeah, this is just like another little one, really. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is from a campsite. This is a, actually, this is from a really funny holiday we had. We'd arranged to go woofing. Do you, know, do, you do woofing in America? It's like work. You could tell me what it is. I might know, but I don't know what woofing is. Well, you can go. You can go and stay at an organic farm. You kind of like you go and stay there for free, and you just do a bit of work and just stay. And we'd booked to go in one on to one in Picardy, and for various reasons, it turned out we arrived, and it was nothing like the photo because the barn had burnt down, and the chap was going away on a Zen retreat. Oh dear! Just, we got left there <laughs> in the middle of Picardy. Uh, but anyway, he's, he's, he's got lots of sculptures around the place, including this. And again, a reason why I put this in is because it's really, temp really tempting. People are really tempted to attribute agency to 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 other things. I mean, we we see faces all over the place. Um, 
we're really tempted to, to attribute agency to robots and people will really quickly assume that computers are, you'll talk about it but the computer decided something as, as if it's actually making a decision so the reason why i chose this picture is because this this scrap metal sculpture of the person obviously is is obviously not an agent it's obviously just a, like a, a pile of scrap metal so again it was just kind of to get students to think about is it so different to a robot it just i mean it doesn't doesn't look like it moves it's just like a rusty pile of metal but but that, that's the reason why I, I chose that and also because I just really liked really like the sculpture well still it has a lot of personality I can imagine anthropomorphizing that little guy <laughs> yeah you can imagine you could imagine deciding what name sure what, yeah was, absolutely yeah. Herman he, maybe <laughs> yeah Herman would be good yes yeah and he'd be great to invite to parties yes <laughs> He wouldn't I can see him toffing his hat. Yeah. He wouldn't help to clear up, but he would be playing the banjo while you cleared up. Yeah, you, you can tell, can't you? He's he's kind of like that. So oh, I can't remember what's coming next. Thing, oh, my God. oh yeah, and again, so I talked a little bit about the idea of super intelligence. So again, I wanted to get away away from the standard the standard images for AI. They're always like brains, you know cross sections of brains you get a standard a standard kind of you can look it up in like in google stock images there'll be a standard image of a um a robot a, bre a brain with lots of um computer bits inside or you know and and this fantastic flower display was actually from the chelsea flower show um so so i keep forgetting that not everyone in, will know but chelsea flower show is like an absolutely massive 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 um flower flower show every year in Britain um, in the grounds of um, the, um, Chelsea Hospital, which is a, a hospital for um, sort of like retired military people. So th this is fan I, I really love this. S some Somebody from Brazil, I think, had done these fantastic flower displays. I don't even know what flowers are. And I just did this um, for super intelligence, pa partly also because a lot of the ways in which people talk about intelligence and especially you can see it in some of the work of some of the philosophers and some of the computer science people who are talking about it. It's got a real slant towards the cognitive. It's a real slant towards thinking of intelligence is, is um, finding quick and efficient ways of achieving a goal or intelligence would be seen to, you know, quick ways of doing calculation or, or, or coming to some rational conclusion, uh, which I think is like a, such a narrow, narrow approach. So actually you were interested in AI and creativity. So that's partly why I put this in because it's like coming out of the, coming out of this sort of, coming out of the head, but, and it's this fantastic display of something, but it's, um, it's sort of visual and organic rather than, rather than the usual kind of image that you'd get. Well, right here, I'd like to show a little clip of a video from a creativity AI thing that I ran across um, this I'll just, morning. I'll, I'll stop the share then, yeah. Yeah, and I will put this on here let's see share sound optimize for video share sometimes my sound takes a moment to uh, gear up so so be patient with it and yeah. at its core was that we invited our visitors to get inspired and draw something and submit these pictures. And behind me, you can see some of these incredible submissions. We put these works of our visitors to a creative artificial intelligence that was hosted at the High Performance Computing Center in Stuttgart. The AI then reinterpreted these drawings using a collection of expressionist masterpieces, the same ones that were going to be displayed at a Kunsthalle in Tübingen simultaneously. So based on these two image domains, the drawings and the expressionists, our AI created something new, expanding into the temporal dimension. And this is the result. It's a new visual phenomena, somewhat resembling a stream of imagination that is subject to ever constant change, bringing up and dissolving form and gestalt and I should say, this work was also shown during the exhibition, inspiring the next visitors to draw something in response. And it really is an example for true human-machine creativity, 
because only the collaboration between these three actors, the drawing visitors, the expressionists, and creative artificial intelligence, brought this work to life. That's also the reason why we picked as a name for the work Wer malt in da? Translating to who's painting there? Because it's not that clear. So. <laughs> Experiences that will be oh, able to oops. make a result. Sorry about that. I'm going to pause for a second. So, Paula, what did you think about that video? What happened? <laughs> I'm going to stop. <laughs> well, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's really interesting how, so for example, there's so many complex things that could be said about this. It's really interesting how he talks about the AI as if assuming the AI has agency. So the AI has done, has done something. I kind of think in a way we need to have a different verb for that. Because of course the whole, the AI is made by humans. So the AI does things that we can't exactly predict. But yeah, so there's lots of things you could say about it. So for example, actually, so when you do watercolors, here's, here's the thing in terms of art, when you do watercolors, one of the things, and you've talked about it yourself in your art, to have un unexpected things in your art, which then become part of the creativity. So one of the things you'd have to think about is, is that just a continuum with what's happening with this AI? Is the AI just a more sort of advanced, sophisticated, complex form of that? But the AI is still something which is, so the process was started by people, the machine and the art separately done by people, and then the AI comes in and then it was done, taken up by, by people again. So that's one, one thing to, to think about. But also when, when we're talking about creativity, the creativity is, is not just what the output is. It's a process, isn't it, that's undergone by people. So, so you'll, since, since you do creative work, you'll be fully well aware that but creativity is a process which affects you as a person and it's something important in people's lives and it's hard to imagine that AI that we have is anything like as sophisticated to have any kind of inner, inner sense of this process of, of, of creativity. So those are, those are some, those are some initial, initial thoughts to it. What, what, what were your thoughts about it? Well, uh, my thoughts were probably a bit informed by the introduction that he had given before he got to that point because at the very beginning of the talk, he made the point that AI is capable of more creative work than humans right. based on this experiment that they did. And yep. I didn't see it. Right. And, yep. and, and also it brought into my mind um, a lot of questions around what is beauty and how do we recognize beauty? And to what extent is art in the realm of beauty. And perhaps art does not have to be beautiful in order to be art. Um, so it, it brought up a lot of questions for me. But, but since you mentioned process, maybe I'll, maybe I'll show a little bit of um, some of my process here. Oh, great. Um, yeah. If I can keep the... <laughs> if I can keep the gremlin inside my computer from going off again. So um, here we go. Now, for some reason, I only have half a screen here. Why did that happen? Anybody know how to undo that? <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Well. And of course the share screen thing comes on right where I need to press my buttons. <laughs> um, I'm gonna stop share here and pause. So I'm gonna share a screen of a series that I did. Um, can you see that? Yes, yes. Okay, so my, my brother-in-law had spent some time in Shanghai and he took a bunch of photographs and he was willing to share some of his photos with me. And this is one of the photos. These are these um, drum ladies, I call them. I, I, what's it called? Tai, taiko, I think. Well, in, in Japan, it's called Taiko. I don't know what they call it in Shanghai. But I was so struck by the, uh, the composition, first of all. Many yeah. things struck me about this photo. 
One is this woman right here who appears to be like gossiping to this lady behind her. Yes. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And one is this lady over here standing all by herself, looking off as though she's not a part of the group. Yes. And so that really struck me about this, this cadre of women. Yes. So I started thinking, how could I turn this into uh, painting? So I decided to use some Adobe Photoshop trickery to try to help myself figure out a path through this, because there's a lot there. If I just painted the thing the way it is, it would, I might as well just keep the photograph, right? Yes. So, um, so this was one of the first things I did was to throw it into a, um, a kind of a revert on the colors and then something called threshold that brings up the darks and lights. And so I could see that where the dark passage is going through there. Wow, connects up all the darks of their hair and uh, and creates some shadows on their shoulders. And I thought, well, that that might make an interesting painting, but I didn't want it to be quite so. I still wanted to keep some of the beauty of it. So then I tried something with just the line thing on Adobe Photoshop where you can like make it sort of. All that all that it enhances is where the edges are. And that gave me some more ideas. I could see the kind of lines moving through. And I also kind of got an impression of even in the area that's white, you can see all this color and texture going through down here. And I thought, that's really interesting. What if I did something like that? So then I did one strictly with just Adobe Photoshop, um, adding my own texture and my own colors in the background. But this is all digital. Oh, wow. And, and just kind of focusing on these seven women. Now, I haven't started painting yet. I'm still working with Adobe Photoshop here. I thought, well, what if I just single out a couple of these women? I kind of like that composition. What if I change it from this more realistic look here over to something that's more like an abstract where I'm just abstracting out the colors and shapes? Well, what if I stretch that out and make it long? Yes. Have some texture, but keep that kind of abstract look. And uh, then I thought, well, I really want to do all seven women. So I did. This is still digital work. OK, and I'm just adding in the texture and collapsing all of their bodies together into one large block here so that I can get this division of space that has a high horizon line uses all of their heads as the horizon line and then has this dominant shape at the bottom. So I'm trying to get dominance and um, subordinate work. I'm trying to get mostly a mid value color scheme and then just have some darks and a few little lights for just kind of draw the eye through. Then I thought, well, you know, what about color? <laughs> Maybe I could do the same thing with color. So all this time, I'm still working with digital stuff. So finally, I did the first painting. And this is the first painting. Wow. And this one is oil. Wow. It's 36 by 36. It's fantastic. It's, it's, it's actually such a fantastic um, composition to work with because there's this just wonderful unity with the individuality coming out of the out of all the, the unity. It's, it's actually really, really wonderful. It's actually a kind of like really, really wonderful illustration of, of, of what, what binds us and about people being bound together, but still retaining their individuality. Because you can see they're all a, they're all a troop. And I've, but yeah, the way in which you've done that into sort of dividing up and the, you know, the way in which the, um, the hairs you know, forms, a, forms a line and it's, it's really fantastic actually. Well, so, I didn't want this little girl over here. I didn't want it to be a sad painting. So I extended this arm out to kind of um, bring her back in. Yes. Right? Yes, that's a nice touch. So, so this one is a square and I really like the square format, but then I decided, well, what if I want to do one in a rectangular format? How would I do that? And so the next few paintings I'm going to show are the steps that I took the first steps are very awkward, which often is the way it is. I, I start, it's awkward, it gets better as it goes along. So don't judge the first one you see coming up. 
So I did this rectangular piece that's 36 by 48, and this is acrylic. Oh, wow. I love that one. Well, I felt like the, uh, the, like the angle of her arm is very awkward to me. Oh, her body is at an odd angle. Um, think the connections just didn't look right to me. That hair on her head looks like a helmet. There are a few things in there I just didn't like. I also didn't like that I didn't have a good color balance here because it's sort of almost equal parts of blue, red, and yellow. And I always feel like you have to have a dominance of either warm or cool in order for the painting to work. So, so this is the second, this is the same painting, but I've refined the figures a little bit. I've gathered three together on this side and four together on this side. And I've made this separation down the middle because in the meantime, I had kind of gotten fascinated with dragonflies and I did a whole series of dragonfly paintings and the dragonfly paintings have the dragonfly coming down roughly two thirds to three fourths of the way across the canvas and then the, the wings across the top. So it's the same division of space as my dragonfly paintings. But I'm still not satisfied here with my, um, my color balance or with the balance of values. And the skin tones are, um, there's, it, there's too much going on in this painting, too much jumping around. There's not enough cohesion to it. So this is my final draft. And I feel like here, because I've, I've got all the skin tones the same, then you don't, your eye isn't jumping around looking at all of them, but you can instead enjoy this large color mass down here at the bottom. Yes. And then this very simple light that goes across the top that still has some color in it, but it's mainly all one big chunk of light. Yeah. So this was the final version. Yeah, the light is, the light is amazing actually. It really, it it really kind of highlights um, highlights their heads, and, and I think actually by doing the getting the skin tones more uniform, it really emphasizes it actually emphasizes their individuality because it emphasizes the different angles that they're all looking at. They're looking in different ways and different uh, looking in different directions of their heads in different angles. So it's 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 lovely actually, and I'm really impressed with um, your diligence in going through and sort of working through and thinking through it all. It's really amazing. The colors are lovely actually. So then I, I can never stick with one thing. So then here's this one. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So here I'm kind of trying to think about who Christ is to us and the way that he kind of shelters us all in his arms, you know? So this again was a digital piece. I did do an actual painting of this, but I don't have a photograph of the actual painting. This was just my digital rendering before I started. Wow, that's lovely. That's really lovely too, actually. As soon as I saw it, I thought that's an angel, but no, it's it's Christ. It's really, it's really, really lovely. So that's kind of the way that I use um, when I'm when I'm using digital stuff. Now, here's another one that I did was just strictly out of my own imagination, and this is where I make a big mess on the paper with a lot of colors, and then I look and I see what can I see. So in this one, I saw this little lady sitting looking up. And so I, I did her in red and kind of enhanced some of the other things that I saw in there. And then this was another one in that same series. And this is another one in that same series. So you just, you just make a kind of random mess on the, on the paper and then- Yes. Yeah, and then I just look like here, I saw this little bird over here. So I put some lines around him. Wherever I see something, I, I put a line around it. And, uh, and then so if I see some figures in here on this particular series, I would, I would put some red in over the figure to kind of yeah. differentiate them from the rest of it. But I was working with a limited palette here because you have to limit something. There's too many choices otherwise. So here I was working with the red and the lime green and uh, gold. This is um, like luminescent gold in the background. Right, it's lovely. Yeah, I really like working with limited palettes. It's, it's, it seems to enhance creativity rather than the other way around, doesn't it? Because you have to, it, it unifies things, but it also, it, 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 you have to then think 
in a maybe in a more creative way about how to use it. But actually, but, but thinking about this actually, and going back to thinking about a, um, the AI pre producing work. Um, can you hear that knocking? Somebody's just started doing some banging. There's been some moving. <laughs> Uh, usually stop by this time of night. Um, well, it's not so loud for us. So if it's okay for you, we're we're good. Yeah. Um, what you were saying about st starting off with a sort of random mess and then seeing shapes in it. So mm -hmm. uh, presumably you, you could program an AI to do that. But the AI, what you're doing is drawing out meaning and significance from the mess. But the AI wouldn't be doing that because the AI in drawing a person isn't going to, isn't going to be thinking, you know, isn't going to be thinking, I remember when we were looking at that uh, when you were looking at that metal sculpture of that robot and we were talking about what sort of person you mm -hmm. can tell what sort of personality you have. They are they are you suppose you could possibly program the AI to spill out that an answer, but it's not going to be it's just not going to be thinking of it in, in those ways. It's not going to be connecting it with meaning. And the, the ways in which so we seem to be programmed. So do you do you find that you usually see figures in is it do you, do you usually always see figures or is it just something? I think I always see something, almost always see something living. Sometimes it's birds or dragonflies yes. or yes. people. Yes. And and I usually see relationships. Yes. Not not so much a thing, but it's something relating to something else. Yes. Yeah. So that's really interesting in terms of thinking about the creativity as well, because because an, an AI could draw a, a sort of a jumble of a jumble of stuff, but it would it I don't know if it would be actually be understanding or thinking about those relationships. Certainly not not any of the AI that we have now. Wait, so so I mean so AI but reads images. Um, so for example, there's, there's AI as you as I'm sure you probably know that the AI is used in medical diagnostics mm -hmm. and it's actually been really successful. So the current state of the art um, is that it works best in conjunction with humans. So that if you have expert, expertly trained humans, an AI in conjunction, you could improve, you could improve the reliability of diagnostics from images. But if you just use AI on its own, it can it can see things that, that the human eye can't see and detect things, but it can sometimes make absolutely insane mistakes that a human would never ever 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 make. Because it's not really under, it's not really understanding the, the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. So you can, and one of the ways one of the ways in which it's trained is by by deliberately deliberately putting in little errors to see if it can spot the error. So there could be a tiny change in two images that the human eye can't even see, and the AI will sort of pick it up and then think it's something completely different. So in other words, the way in which it's like seeing is totally and utterly, totally and utterly different to how we we see it. Mm -hmm. how, how, we're, how, we're, how we're looking at the, looking at the images. So it's, I mean, it's, I'm not at all surprised when you say that you normally see something living because we're, <laughs> We're prejudiced towards the living, aren't we? It seems to be a biased, biased part of our our brain. We see often. Actually, I've, I forgot to put it in the um. I forgot to put it in the the, 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 the slides. But one of the at the start of lockdown last year, I had a bag of potatoes delivered by the milkman because when you couldn't go out to the shops, we have milk. We have like old fashioned milkmen here who come and deliver the milk, and and I pulled a potato out of it, and it and it just had a face in it. It had a little face. I'll send it. I'll send it to you a picture afterwards. Yeah. Really, like a face, two little eyes, and a smile. And then it's like a new potato. So I had a little bit of skin coming up, like the, the hair. So I, I used that as a kind of like a, lo a logo for lots of my slides as well. I pity I didn't include it. But so we just see faces and things the whole time. That's what that's, we, we're constantly. But it's, it's, but it's significant. But we're doing that. If if a, if you could probably train an AI to see faces and things, but it's not recognizing a similar being. <laughs> It's, it's, it's well, that's one of the things that um, abstract and non objective artists have to be very careful about to make sure that they don't inadvertently have something yeah. in their painting. Because I used to be part of a critique group, and somebody would put up a painting that they had done that was supposed to be completely non objective, and they'd say, What do you think? And someone else in the group would say, Well, I see that monster over in the corner, and they're like, What monster? <laughs> But then if you look at it in a certain way, oh, yes, there's two eyes and a nose and there's this horrible gargoyle hiding over there in the corner. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a Twitter account um, of faces in things. Have you seen it? It just like shows. No, like, I haven't face, seen it. <laughs> faces in slices of toast, faces in, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the way we're built, right? Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> sometimes that'll show up in my work without me being aware of it. And I'll just leave it there kind of in the background for somebody to find if they want to, you know, as long as it's not something really grotesque or awful or something, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, is that, is that typical of your creative process to do that? To do those lots of iterations and. Um, well, what's more typical of my creative process right now? Well, I can show you real quick. I've got a, I've got one. Um, let's see. This would be, I would start out with a lot of color like this. Right. And then after I start out with a lot of color, sometimes I will, um, this, I'm, I'm gonna show you things out of order and these aren't all with the same painting, but just give you an idea of things. Okay. Something like this, I would lay a lot of patterning and mess like this over the top of it. And then I would pick out where I can, Wow. In this particular one, I had a photograph of a woman sitting like this, and I thought, well, I'll draw out the woman that I have in the photograph on top of all this color, and then I'll try to gather it together. And uh, then I started, I here's my woman. She's still there. I've tried to back off the background a little bit, and I've started adding in. These are stampings. All right. Um, I don't know if you can see, I have this stamp and I put color on it and I, sometimes it's in the negative and sometimes it's in the positive. Um, this is another stamp that I have and, and I just start adding in lines. I just start adding in weird stuff all over. I don't know if you can see this over here. Yeah. And here I stamped in, I have a placemat that's got kind of an irregular series of squares on it. And so oh. I, I painted through the placemat there and uh, added in all this kind of stuff. Okay, so that's where I'm at. And then I'm trying to bring it into a little bit more relief. I add this chair behind her so that her shoulder is more obviously set off from the rest of the background. Then I thought, well, it's still something I don't like about it. So I tried laying the photograph over, laying the painting over a photograph that I had of some flowers. And I thought, what would happen if I added some flowers in the background? I didn't like that. So I brought up this image what? and I thought, what if I overlay this image onto the painting? So I did that here. Now I have a lot of noise. Yes, yes. Now I can look at all this noise and I can decide what out of this noise I want to paint. Yes. And so that's, here's some of that noise. Wow, yes. Here's some of that noise. Now over here, this was that stamping. You remember that stamping yep. that was there before? But I looked at that stamping and I thought that looks like a woman's hair. Yes. So I added a woman's face and oh, a woman. Yeah. I had these lines already from that noise that was going through. Yeah. And I just backed off a shoulder there. So there's a figure in the background now. And uh, and here's the final version because I wanted the background to be all dark around. So I wanted her to blend in a little bit more to the background so she wouldn't be quite so prominent Yes. because this is the star of the show right here. Yes. So this was the final painting. So that's more the kind of process that I go through mostly. Yeah, really interesting. And she really is the star of the painting. It's, it's, it, she's in such, such relief about it. And it's uh, she just seems to be so um so so set in the set in the scene but it's it's a, uh, it's really great there's a combination between how she stands out from the scene but she's also integrated into it there's a real that's, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's really my goal is to get this push pull going between the background and the foreground yes so that maybe you look at it at first and it's like so much stuff you can't differentiate but then all of a sudden it'll kind of come into relief yes and then they'll they'll look like they're knitted together Yes, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, that's really, really interesting, actually, because actually, in a sense, that relates to, in a very general sense, that relates to some of the things that I was talking about in terms of um, trying to, um, um, in, in teaching ethics and in teaching the, the philosophy, trying to get students to um, sort of change their perspective or to see how one thing's related to other, how things are dis, 
actually it also relates to the day really how, uh, how things are distinct but also mm -hmm. related to everything about and it can look like a big mess or you can get you can get sort of meaning out of it and it also so much depends on on um where you're focusing actually one of the other if i could just share the screen again one of yeah. the, one of the, one of the photos i had um one of the photos i had to um i can't remember whereabouts in my i just might zip through that's enough that's enough I can just zip past that's a, a, a zipping past because they're all in order that's another super, super intelligence Woo! <laughs> Oh yeah, actually, I'm just super. That's another one, superhuman. This is a this is an art exhibition. I put I put this in because um, again, because it's it 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 slightly upsets the standard ways in which people think about you no know, about human enhancement. But I'll just sit forward to um, the one I was thinking about. Where is it? Oh yes, yes. Sorry, back again. Yeah, this is what I was thinking about when we were talking about figure figure and ground. So. So one of one of the points that I really wanted to emphasize to students, the way in which the way in which a lot of um, questions in ethics are looked at is by maybe taking some ethical theory or having a sort of general way of looking at ethics and then trying to apply it into different you know, to different cases. So you might take a theory like utilitarianism and then try to apply it to particular cases. But there's a whole range of other questions other philosophical questions which tend to get put to one side and one of the questions that I'm most concerned about is where we get sort of moral knowledge from or in other words or how we relate directly to the environment around us or how we actually perceive what's morally relevant and what isn't and so much about it depends so much of that depends on our attention and so much of that depends on on what we're focusing on and how we actually see it so again, this was also taken from the top of a Pompidou Centre on that, that funny little holiday when we eventually got out of Picardy. We managed to, we, went, we had to walk miles to the train station because we'd been abandoned there. We just got a train to Paris and went to Paris instead. So this was part of that, that, that funny holiday. So what, I took well, a picture like that from the top of the Pompidou too. I remember that. <laughs> So when you look at, when you look at this picture, I, I used it to illustrate the point. So what, what it, so what is it that you see in this picture? You might look at it and see the people. You might look at it and see the, the pigeons, but also if you look, there's shadows, just as many shadows as people. There's also, if you look, actually some really interesting marks in the paving. So that, so that it was just like to illustrate that what is this, what is this picture of and what, what's drawing your attention? In a sense, the pigeons can draw your attention because of the movement, it's fantastic, but there's movement in the people as well. So is it, again, this is just, this is just like a general, um, yeah, a, a, a general image that I'd use just to try to sort of wake students up to this to this idea of paying what it is to pay attention to things. I, I always really like those paintings that people do from this perspective when they're looking down on the people and the shadows and everything. Yes, 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 yeah, yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, and all actually, so also because you're looking down on the people. So you're so so the, the question is, where do you place yourself in the picture? That's such a really important, I know we just suddenly jumped back to talking about ethics in, that's such a really important thing to think about actually. So I think it's the next slide. I just used a really simple, um, that's something which is often overlooked. Sorry, I've just lost my, I'm always doing this, but yeah, I lost my little mouse thing. Just, get, just, just to illustrate, sorry, I'm jumping about a bit and talking again about the, the, the teaching ethics, but. Well, you know, we, this quote that's up here, you are outside the scene watching it about from above, nothing will happen to you. Yes. For some reason, I don't have, I, I never memorized a lot of stuff, but when I was in college, there was one line that I memorized because I was a drama major and I think it was probably a line in a play. Right, right. Oh, wow. Right. It, it is a privilege of the great to witness catastrophe from a terrace. <laughs> Oh wow! Isn't That's that a, exactly the same thing, right there? Yes, yes. Well, actually, one, 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 what one could one could say that that's happening a lot at the moment, uh, like <laughs> with yep. with our politicians, perhaps witnessing catastrophe from their private islands and so on. Um, so this quote comes from. Um, have you heard of um, 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 MIT um, MIT's Media Labs Moral Machines Experiment? No, but I got to look that up. So it's really interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an experiment um, based upon the trolley problem. Have, have you heard of a trolley problem? Yes. Uh huh. 
Yeah, so but maybe maybe for those in the yeah in the viewers that haven't, you should reiterate it. Okay, so the trolley problem uh, was uh, was was first originated in uh, 1967 by uh, Philippa Foote, who was a um, a philosopher. She was at, she was um she was at Somerville College in Oxford, and she, she actually it's interestingly just as a little aside, um, she and Elizabeth Anscombe and Iris Murdoch were all um, uh, sort of philosophers at Oxford, and actually it's interesting because they they. Um, that they were really dominant in moral philosophy and, and actually helped to sort of revive work in moral philosophy in the sort of Anglo sphere of, of, of philosophy, sort of working um, well in the years following the war. Although interestingly, Philippa Foote was actually born in the White House. So, so that, that's, that's an, an irrelevant fun fact. Um, so what is problem, Philippa's last name? Foote, foot, as in, as in, as in foot, as in leg. So, so yeah. Um... And just a couple of things here. I have a couple of episodes on Iris Murdoch, um, oh, which I'll yeah. put in the in the yeah. description. Yeah. Very yeah. fun conversations about Iris Murdoch. Right. And uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, is that the Anscombe that um, that roundly defeated C.S. Lewis in a debate and from which he had to rethink his theology? <laughs> It sounds, it sounds like it would have been, it sounds like it would have been, she was, she was, yes, yeah, she was very, a, a, a great character, a friend, and also a friend of um, Ludwig Wittgenstein's. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, she was, she was, a, she was a, a, a great, there's lots of stories about, uh, there's lots of stories about Elizabeth Anscombe. Anyway, so the trolley, the trolley problem, there's various variations of it, but it's a version of a problem where there's a train going down, a loose train going down a trolley, and if it goes straight ahead, it's going to kill a certain number of people and you could pull the switch and it will go down another route, but it will kill a few, you know, just one person or a fewer number of people. So there's lots of lots of different versions of that. And the question is, um, are you just, should you allow a greater number of people to die or should you do something positive and save their lives, but you're actually positively choosing to kill another person? There's lots of different ver versions of it. And in the Bo Moral Machines experiment, there, but it's sort of basically crowdsourcing ethics, if you like, because there are, this is applied to um, autonomous cars to try to see what ethics we should program into autonomous cars. So you're, you're imagining different scenarios where, and, and, and you, can go, you can go through and do it and just give your answers, where um, if the car goes straight ahead, it's going to sort of um, run down a, a, and kill or injure, say a pregnant woman and a dog, or you could swerve to one side and kill two men or, or, or different variations like that. So this sounds, this sounds dangerously like the, uh, the old values clarification stuff that was going on in the seventies. You know, the, that they started use, they started using this in the classroom in high, junior high and high school, which I thought was just terrible. Um, the lifeboat thing or the, um, yes. the uh, bomb shelter, you know, you, you can only save 20, you can only let 20 people in, which 20 are you going to let in? And then they have a yes. list of people. Yes. Yes. You know, this one uh, is a 70 year old, but most of their life is done already. This one's a homeless person. This one is a, an MIT professor of uh, science who could save the world after it starts up again, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then you pick which 20 you're going to let in there with you. Yes, it's similar. It's similar to that, actually. It's similar to that yeah. because the characters, the characters, the characters change. So, yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's also actually, it's also actually a strange variation on the trolley problem because the whole point about the trolley with it being a train is that there's two definite routes it's going to go on. But if you're drive, if you're driving, um, if you're driving, it's much more, it's much more uncertain, isn't it, as to what exactly is going to happen? So it's very artificial. But the thing that I, but, but the thing that when I we're doing, we were discussing this in class. The thing that, oh, I haven't, I haven't got my video on. Can you see me? Uh, no, I can't. All oh, right, okay, it's been- There I've, you are, okay. Turned off, not turned off, there you are. I've come back, I've come back from blackness. Um, the thing that really struck me when I looked at it was the instructions to people, which are these instructions to, to, think, to think of yourself as you're trying to decide which way the car should go but you are outside the scene watching it from above and nothing will happen to you, which is very similar to what you've just been talking about, but, but from your quotation from that play. Um, and it struck me as this, this is one way in which you might want to think about 
making decisions like this. But to think that this is the way in which you try to approach a moral question struck me as being just absolutely appalling. To think that, that you're, you're not going to be affected by it, and it's something that you're trying to impose a kind of, maybe you could think of it as a kind of rationality or something that maybe a bureaucrat could do because the same person's just going to be coldly making a decision. So that's the kind of thing. No, there, there was an actual trolley problem that actually happened in uh, Hokkaido in the early 1900s. And it was dramatized in a novel called Shiokari Pass, written by a Japanese woman who, she got some sort of award in Japan for you know, one of the best novels of the decade or something like that. But it's a true story about uh, a man who became a Christian. His, his coming to Christ was a very interesting part of the novel. <clears throat> but the end of the novel is, and, and I'm going to do a spoiler here. <laughs> um, he worked on the railroad and he was, it was his task to um, go with the train, or, or no, he happened to be on a train because he was going across the mountains to be with his fiance and they were gonna get married. So he's on the train and the somehow the car that he was on got decoupled from the rest of the train and they're up in the mountains and so they're going over Shiokari Pass. And so this train is loose and without control and it starts coming down the pass. And he knew this route extremely well. So he knew when it was gonna go around a curve, when it went around that curve, it would shoot them out over the mountains and the train would go down into the chas chasm and everybody would be killed. He knew that was coming. So the choice he made was to jump onto the tracks in front of the train so that his body would divert the train into the mountain and. and and slow it down wow so he gave his life for that train full of people he didn't decide oh i'll i'll you know i'll die along with these people or i'll you know it it's a little bit different than the trolley problem because he didn't really have very many choices yes but he made the choice that would save everybody at the expense of his own life and um it's quite an amazing story, but it's a true story. And of course, we see that story played out over and over again with men that'll jump on a, a, a grenade in order to save the rest of the men in their troop, you know. So um, love makes decisions that computers can't make. <laughs> yes, yes. yes, it's, a, yes, it's, a, it's an amazing story, isn't it? Um, I just thought it was, I just thought it was really dangerous to, to um, give people the idea that, that to, thinking from something outside the, the scene nothing's mm -hmm. going to happen nothing's going to happen to you as if as if this is a, a more objective way of making a, de a, a decision yeah i think that's a horrifying that, that when i hear that kind of stuff i just get it what's the word it raises the hackles on my back yes, yes. There's, 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 a, there's a version of a trolley problem which involves um you're standing on a bridge and there's a train train coming down and whether or not you could stop the stop the, stop the train. I mean, it, it, it seems almost actually really disrespectful to even mention this after the, that story that you just said. But 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 you're standing on the bridge next to a really fat man. <laughs> Whether or not you should push the fat man onto the bridge to stop the train, and it never suggests that you. It never suggests that you could jump down and stop the train yourself. It's always about whether you should push somebody else in front of the train. It seems. Wow. I mean, we really. When I, you know, when I think, I think you're younger than I am, but when I think back to when I was much younger, it just seems to me like, even with all the problems that we had, and I came of age during the hippie years, there still was some sort of deep regard for human beings that seems to be completely missing now. I mean, the very idea that you could think about a fat person as being so lacking in value that you would use them as a train stopper. I mean, it, it, it's just so, we're so bereft. We are so yeah. bereft in this age. <laughs> I, obviously the idea is just that they, they just would, they would have, 
you know, enough, a skinny little enough person. mass, yes, mass. yes. It's yeah. just, you've got a point, just thinking about them simply in terms of the, simply in terms of the mass. Mm -hmm. Of course, you could always ask the person, do you want to give your life for this train full of people? <laughs> That might be that might be preferable. We <laughs> pushed. Yes. Wow. So we're outside the scene right now, Paula. We're outside the scene. Yes. Yeah. I stop, stop the share. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I probably interrupted your. Um, where did we get I lost track? Oh of no, 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 no! I wherever we went, it was great. It was yeah. great. You were talking about where do we get moral knowledge from, yes. and and how do we determine how do we determine what moral knowledge is relevant? Yes, yeah. Or, so, um, and that's where I derailed us with my quote from the play. <laughs> oh, but quote from but the that play. also got us onto the moral machines experiment. So I learned about Elizabeth Anscombe, and we were able to mention Iris Murdoch. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, there was, there was another there was another professor. Um, there at the time, um, Richard Hare, who uh, taught moral philosophy, and he used to talk, I, I'd always mistakenly thought that he'd come up with a trolley problem because he used to talk about it. He was a prisoner of war um, who worked on the Thai Burma Railway. And he mm. it, it obviously uh, experience had affected him an awful lot, actually. He used to talk about, he used to talk about his experiences a, a great deal. And he used to talk about actually witnessing a loose truck coming down the, the, the railway line and people would yell out from time to time, loose truck, loose truck. And I'm going to forget the story now, but he did tell some story about it was coming down and there was a question about whether you should try to divert it. Um, nobody did anything. And as it came around the corner, it was full of Chinese, you know, Chinese, because um, they had lots of Chinese slaves as well as for um, Europeans. And if they mm -hmm. had, they'd have been killed. So I don't, he said, if he never found, I don't think he ever found out what happened to them, but it was, it's, that's, listening to him talk about that and actually years and years later I went to Thailand and went to the bridge over the river Kwai where there's a there's a, a really really moving museum of about the um the Thai Burma railway actually and it kind of just really struck it really struck me about I used to sit in Richard Hare's lectures um and it makes you realize that you haven't really taken it in when, when the experience of going there and just kind of like imagining what it must be like to have worked on that railway and seen the amount of suffering and then come back to anything anything like a sort of like normal life. It, 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 I think that was one of the, just going there and kind of like sinking in what it must have actually, obviously I don't know what it was, must have been like, but like realizing that I didn't know what it was, what it must have been like. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the formative experiences I had in terms of thinking about how you would actually get these ideas across. And that's probably one of the reasons why I, I react so badly to these things like you know the moral machine experiment just sitting there thinking oh would, would i rather save um a family with a, a a dog and a baby or two scientists or <laughs> well see that's the whole thing i think about the 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 big hole in ai is the lack of capacity for empathy because a human being if they don't a human being has the capacity to make themselves stand outside the scene yes. and think rationally or objectively about a situation and make those kinds of decisions very cold and calculating. We certainly can, but we also have the capacity to go inside that situation and be the pregnant woman with the two children and be the slave who is being mistreated and yes. and and to feel those feelings if we will let ourselves go there a lot of times we won't because it's too hard right yes. but if we will let ourselves go there we have that capacity but i don't think an ai has or ever could have no that no capacity no no it, it couldn't it couldn't have that capacity because it wouldn't have i mean unless it, you know that's there's the old uh, star trek is it star trek episode with um data where he gets this the skin um transplant the the woman have you did you ever watch star trek yeah years and years ago like really okay early. so that woman that beautiful woman that was the head of the borg yes she transplants skin onto data's hand right so he's capable of feeling pain 
Right, right. And capable of feeling pleasure. Right, right. And that changes the whole matrix for him completely, right? Yes. Because now he's embodied. Now he can go in and experience. He can empathize. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yes. But without without that, yeah, because AI hasn't 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 got a body. But also, it's because it's not. I think one of the important things as well is it is that it's not individuated. So it's actually. But I mean, that gets back to some of the things I loved about that picture with the with the Chinese um, drummers, the way in which you captured their connection and their individuation as separate mm -hmm. individuals. So we're, we're, if you like, we're, we're stuck as, we're trapped as in, not trapped is the wrong word, but we're sort of irrevocably different individuals. Um, but an AI, I mean, it's a machine, it could be taken to pieces and reassembled again. It's never going to be an, it's never going to be an individual in the way that we are. We can't be just, I mean, even if you have an organ transplant, you're not the other person, you've just got an organ from them. So. So, but, but an, an AI is, is never going to, it's not just that it hasn't got the experiences of, you know, feeling pleasure and pain and, and, and a myriad other feelings that we have. It, it's never going to be a unique individual in a way that we are. Because mm -hmm. even if you make a, make a robot, you can, you can take it apart. <laughs> well, and, and maybe, uh, I might be stretching it a little bit, but what's coming into my mind is a, a series I did of a mother and daughter where um, because I was working through the elements and principles of design in this class and yeah. every week we were to focus on a different element and some different principles yes. and then just see what would happen in terms of the creative chain and the, the differentiation that takes place is so remarkable. And I mean, I wasn't alone in this, all the other people who, who did this with me had the same experience. But this is a series that I did where um, <clears throat> I had a photograph of a mother and her daughter. This is just a little drawing that I had done of a mother and daughter before I started the series. <clears throat> it, it's not the exact confirmation that, that you'll see, but um, it was a mother and she was feeding her daughter. I was at a luau in, Japan, in uh, Hawaii. And the mother was feeding her daughter. And so I just had a tiny snapshot because I caught her across the way. So I had this little snapshot of this mother and daughter. And uh, I just loved the way that they were together. Yeah, so so I, I was trying to think, how do I draw this connections between them? So I was trying to draw the connections with color, with line. And um, I can never do anything the same style twice. So that's the one you just showed. The light, the light coming down on from a mother's face onto the child. It's yes, like yeah, that that was like your daughter's thing, right? So I was trying to use the light as the connecting point there. It works. It works really well. It just also kind of looks like it, it works. It looks like it's kind of flowing from the mother to the daughter, but the daughter is the one that's really shining. It's always the mothers always mothers always focus more on their children than on themselves, don't they? Well, it's, I mean, so much of this series made me think about that. What what is the legacy that we are imparting to our children, you know? And uh, so in this one, I was trying to capture the idea of being enfolded, right? The way that the mother enfolds the child. Yes. Um, here they are just connected in the midst of nature and the world. Yes, that's really lovely. Here's one where I, I love her little face. <laughs> so here's another one um, where the mother is showing that, you know, it's just the idea here, look, this is what's beautiful. I want you to look at these beautiful things with me. Here's one where the light is coming through again, you know, and connecting the two of them. Yeah, it's beautiful. This is one interesting this one i actually did on crumpled tin foil wow so tin foil doesn't absorb paint so the paint was really moving around fast <laughs> so, so i wasn't able to get too precise with the drawing or any of that but i thought it the texture of, of wow. suffering and life and everything that it captured was pretty yeah. interesting is that, is, that, is that a thing i never was that your idea or was it 
Um, I had seen I had seen a painting where someone had taken a tiny piece of foil and crumpled it up in the corner and glued it onto a painting and then painted over it. So I had seen that, but then I thought, well, what would happen if I did the whole painting on foil? Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. And so then this this one is um, just making use of the drips as they came down and trying to see where her face would show up inside the drips and. This was one where I had just spritzed a lot of paint and and drips and everything all over the paper. And then I went in and I figured out where can I draw the mother and daughter in the midst of that that would make sense. And so this, which what's her hair here was actually just a big blob of paint on the paper before, but I used it for her hair. Yes. And then I used the drips to connect the two of them together and to draw the draw draw her in. It really has a it really has a feeling actually of of a connection between the two because it to me it 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 really really has a feeling of sort of safety and coziness of sh sheltering from sheltering from torrential rain mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so then these last three are mother and daughter paintings that i did after i was finished with this series and i was no longer restricted to using this same right. yeah. confirmation and and with these well, i might have done these before these i used um photoshop to help me with the uh, kind of the revert on the colors to see how I might use the colors. So these look a little bit more like photographic um, negatives, maybe. The colors are lovely. Oh, wow. So where the background and the foreground intersect with each other. So such, yeah, such a lovely connection between the figures. Yeah, I, I I loved motherhood when my daughter was little and and uh, we had a connection that the teenage and young adult years are a little bit more challenging. <laughs> so, yes, and you, yeah. you, you, so one of your one of your daughters is at twenty six. Did you say? And the other one's yeah, and the other one is um, all grown up and has a daughter of her own. So, yeah, I won't give her age. But my granddaughter's fifteen, so <laughs> actually, so so um, I don't know how much how much longer you wanted to to carry on. We've been chatting. If for there a while. was something else you wanted to talk about, I'm fine. Well, I, well, I could I could just quickly then show you. I could just quickly then show you. Um, I mean, I've got I've got I've got loads of them, but I could just show a few for illustration. Some of those they're completely different to yours because they're such quick, quick, really quick sketches of the mm -hmm. of the, the, the sketchbooks I did. Um, I share, share screen again. Mm -hmm. So, looking at your sketches makes me think I should take a class in illustration because you seem to um, have the capacity to show ideas. Well, this is this is something this is something completely this is something different actually. So this is these are just some just just some examples. I started off with because I because I I. Because I'd seen a video that you did where you showed some mother and daughter photos, I started off with some pictures of the, of the children. So this mm -hmm. is just this is just like this is completely different. But it was just I was thinking about talking to you. I was thinking about and thinking about AI and technology. I was just thinking about some of the ways that we can look at the world differently and maybe counter some of the ways in which technology is pushing us to look in certain ways. So that actually, in some senses, I did be all I did all of these drawings terribly, terribly quickly. They're all kind of rough and rough and ready, but this is. But that's where you capture the gesture so beautifully. See, when you do a when you do a drawing that quickly, you capture the gesture so much more realistically. Yeah, because you have because you just you're just trying to get the essence of it, and you have to be yeah. quick the way move. So this is from uh, uh, this is from my cousin Bronwyn, um, who's uh, she's the same age as me. She lives in um, she was brought up in Vancouver. She lives in British Columbia. We were pen pals when we were children, and we had a we had a holiday where we went to it some time ago now. It's 2004, I can see from the date. So, so this was a picture where she was reading, um, where she's reading um, a story to my daughter Indigo. And I, I just kind of love it's that that lovely kind of like that settling into somebody's shoulder while you're listening to a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. And this one was for kids. So, so that's that's Indigo and Ruben. Indigo was just turned. Indigo had just turned six, I think, and Ruben was getting on for eleven. And we went out on boating on a lake, and the boat broke down. And we had to go <laughs> When are we gonna go home, mommy? <laughs> well, you can see this. Oh, well, the boat's not moving right now. 
<laughs> when are they going to come and rescue us and tow us back? So that was, that was for, with a little life jackets on. So that was that was those. And these this is this is back to the picture of Bronwyn. She had to steer as we were towed back. That's her steering steering the boat. And then they went we went they went swimming. They went swimming and came out of the lake and were absolutely freezing. So it's oh, you really captured the shivering. Man, I can feel it in my bones. <laughs> So, you know, I think you could use that style to do a children's book. Oh, right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Maybe I could, maybe I can use the style in, um, in that book on Aristotle. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's also kind of like really reminds me of all our, um, of all our holidays. Because if you go on holiday in Britain, you're always freezing when you come out of the sea. You're always absolutely shivering and dying to get dressed as soon as possible. So, but so actually, so so some of the some of the things that I and I've looked through. I've got a few notebooks from different um, different trips. One of the things that I was thinking about is that you that I would do drawings of things. If you took a photograph of it, the photograph would unless you were a fantastic photographer, the photog photograph would probably look like nothing. But we 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 went and stayed. So we had this trip up to the to the lake, and my cousin's got a, a cabin by a lake in the Okanagan. And it's absolutely absolutely lovely out there. We just stayed in this little cabin that's just got a sort of stove and um, it's you know, really running kind of like back to nature like lifestyle. And it rained a lot of the time, so this is just like my daughter's boots kind of like soaking wet and warming up by the fire. So again, another little quick sketch. But and I, I, one of the things I find by doing drawings instead of photographs is it makes you remember things in a different way because of the time that you're spending observing them. And it, it yeah. makes you focus down on things that you would, but you know, little deep, little, those little details of life, but make up a different set of, of di different set of memories. But if you're, if you're taking photographs of, you know, so like, so my, my, my son visited last week, I hadn't seen him for ages because of a pandemic. And we, we did have a day, tourist day out. We went on, on a boat to up, up the river and then to, went to the Tower of London. So you see people who take like pictures of the, of the um all the beef eaters and so on but it's but a lot of the drawings i've done are just a very little trivial things but they're kind of like really really important in terms of the memories of what was going on so yeah again this is when this is when we were absolutely poor soaked with rain and we had we hung up all our soaking wet clothes to dry in this little wood wooden cabin um and this was again this is just a little moment of um um, Reuben was light, concentrating on lighting a stick from a candle because he was just—he was just getting old enough that he was allowed. That he was allowed to do things with fire, you know. That kind of concentrate—it doesn't—it doesn't look much like him actually, but that concentration of that concentration of like mm -hmm. trying to light a trying to light a stick, and yeah, it's pouring with pouring with rain. <laughs> and I, said, oh, I think it's, it's just the the whole thought process here that you're talking about, where drawing makes you slow down and think about the moment and remember the moment in a unique way that you don't get from photography yes, yes. so i hope if anybody's listening i hope they will start to do that and give it a try because um you might have taken a photograph of those boots by that chair and years later you'd look at the photo and you'd think well why ever did i take that photograph you know <laughs> What what was the point of that? You know, I maybe that's just one that didn't get pitched out when it should have gotten pitched out. But but if you draw it, then you know that there was a purpose in it. You know, there was some meaning there, right? Yeah, that was exactly what I was thinking. You would think you would think, and and if like if somebody somebody else was looking through them, they would think they must have they must have taken that photograph by mistake. But they wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't, you wouldn't think there was a reason for taking it. But now seeing those boots by the fire, I now remember how lovely it was being in that little cabin with my cousin. My cousin is absolutely lovely person. She's, ab she's absolutely lovely. Um, being with my cousin and my two children in this little cabin by this beautiful, beautiful lake with it pouring with rain outside. That lovely feeling of being, it's really nice actually being inside with a fire when it's pouring with rain. <laughs> you don't really mind being damp. And this, this is a later photograph, actually not photograph, a, dra a drawing. Yeah, again, so these are all really tr quick drawings, um, partly because you were the kids, so you didn't have much time. But as again, you have to select what you're talking about. There's a process you always have to select because obviously with photography, you're selecting. And, and if you're a really good photographer, then that's a, a real art as well. But it's a different kind of art. 
And this again, this doesn't look much like Ruben actually, but it kind of captured his 10 year old boy wondering where my pizza is <laughs> after a long day of traipsing around. And yeah, and oh, is it, it's another little detail because again, this is, this is a drawing I did of Ruben's socks, Ruben's damp socks drying on the arm. There's a, there's a wicker chair out on the veranda. These are just like socks, but the patterns in his socks, soaking wet socks drying on the veranda. But you, again, you, if I'd taken a, a photograph of some wet socks, I'd think it was a mistake and chuck it out. So that's, for, that's the kind of thing. And I, I would, I, again, like you, I'm glad you said that because I'd really like to encourage encourage people and again this on the side this is just like a tidy little drawing I did Bronwyn's got a really lovely medicinal herb garden um and I, I just did a, a tidy little drawing of one of a, one of the plants but again it's just for just a little detail because plantains are plantains are, are wonderful plants actually but they're quite simple plants and if you just if you saw a little just an ordinary little photograph of it and again because you're doing a drawing you leave out the whole of a background if I'd taken a photograph of this it would just look like why has I taken a photograph of that weed? You don't, you don't yeah. have to be really good to make it focus on the on the actual on this little um, plantain. Well, the other thing I think is so marvelous about your drawings is that um, because you're doing them quickly, there's no intent to focus on the details, and that's such a good thing because if you're not focused on the details, you're your focus is on the bigger picture. Your focus is on the meaning. And this is something that my, the teacher that I was in with that class so many times, he always said, you are not painting things, you are painting relationships. You are not painting eyelashes or yes. fingers, you are painting relationships. Yes. How does that fit into, how does that face fit into the painting? How does that hand fit into the body? Yes. So, so don't focus on the details, focus on the relationships. Or if you have to, don't focus on the thing, focus on to the shape of the negative space around the thing, because that will bring your, your focus out. So you get a more holistic view. Yes. And that's what I get looking at your work is that you have this, there's an immediacy to it instead of it being laboring over it to make sure that every hair is correct and every eyelash is in there and, you know, everything is exactly, you know, perfect. You've gone for the immediacy and the meaning and the relationship and, and that's what makes them so charming and I love it. Oh, and and that's the whole thing about travel sketching. I think there are there are a number of YouTube channels I think that teach travel sketching, oh, how right. to go about it for people who want to. And you can do that. You don't have to take a lot of stuff with you, right? A couple of ink pens and a pencil and a notebook. Yes, you don't have to, you don't you don't have to take anything with you. I mean, it's I, obviously people take photos on their mobile phones now, but it's much, much lighter than actually lugging a camera. One of my problems is I've actually got, I've got, a, a, I've got a, I haven't got a smartphone. I've got a little dumb phone, but I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got a really good camera, but it's really heavy. Yeah. So, so you could just, you could just take, you just need to take a little book. And, and if the worst comes to the worst, you can always do a sketch on, on, a, on the back of a, the back of a receipt or something if you've, if you haven't got a piece of piece of paper but it'll, it'll also it's like it's doing it quickly it's partly it's partly also actually making a virtue out of necessity because i had young kids at the time so everything you do you have to do really quickly <laughs> because you're going to get interrupted any second well when my daughter was little the only way i could ever keep her entertained when we were at a restaurant is if i would draw barney for her over and over and over you know barney the big purple dinosaur <laughs> I got very good at drawing Barney quickly. <laughs> yes, well done. So I've got, I've got, I've, I've put so many of these, but I, there's probably far too many. But um, again, this was just like, there was a, um, there was a, a cover on the chair, but I got eaten a little pole eaten by a mouse. And I, I darned it one morning when the other people, were, when Bronwyn and the kids were out buying some bricks for the fireplace. So it was just like, like a record of that little, little darn that I'd done. Oh, and this is this is a different kind of picture actually. This is more like a kind of like a record. Um, so Mary, Auntie Mary was Bronwyn's mother, and my my father had visited 
years and years and years before mum and dad had gone over to stay with them in Canada because Jeff was his brother so so Je so dad's younger brother Jeff used to travel travel around the world um a lot Actually, quite a long time ago sort of in the 1930s he's he sailed around the world but dad and Jeff had both started out actually they got hired by some really rich person who had a yacht to sort of sail around the world with him and they first set off from from whatever in England and after a short time at sea there was a terrible storm they were at stops at sea for ages in, a, in an awful storm and eventually found land and they, they thought they were kind of like miles away but they were actually just in Guernsey they'd been they'd been blown back to Guernsey so dad got off and then got a job on Guernsey um, as, a, as a tutor to, to somebody and J his younger brother Jeff went on sailing around the world this is a long why am I telling you this that telling you and uh, went on sailing around the world um, on the yacht which was a thing that people didn't do in those days but the person he was working with just kind of like abandoned him in the Middle East and he then found all his he'd gone off of all his stuff he, he, he ended up in Canada so that's that's how he I got wow what a story yeah. there's so a he, novel in that for sure yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he just he just went off and shore somewhere in the Middle East and went back and, and the person had had sailed off with all his possessions and everything so he just worked his way he worked his way around the world via Australia where actually here's another little bit of it his surname is the same as mine, it's Boddington, and he was hitching a lift in Australia and uh, said to the lorry driver, oh, I need to find somewhere to stay the night. He said, oh, I'll take you to a farm where people will put you up. And those people were also called Boddington, which is like, it's quite an unusual surname. So, so wow. anyway, he ended up in Canada. So this was a, dad had made him a bowl, a wooden bowl and taken it over. And then uh, my aunt had used it, perhaps inadvisably, to, to keep a pot plant in so it was damp and it split open. So, so, so I, they gave me to take to. They were a bit embarrassed, I think. <laughs> Split open. They gave it to me to take home, which I've, 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 I've still got it. So that's just like a little, a little record of a bit of family history. So you were able to fix it. Yeah, I, I, I've got it. Hang on. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Beautiful. Yeah. yeah look at that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so your dad must have been quite a woodworker. Well, well, he, he taught. Yeah, he taught. He taught. Um, he taught woodwork. He, he did. He did. He didn't do a massive amount. Oh, that's of right. He, he, and that's why you learned woodworking in high school. Yeah. Now I remember. Yeah. yeah. And this, this was another. This was. I mean, actually, one of the reasons why I put this in is because, I mean, some of the some of the drawings, some of the drawings I quite like, and some are actually really not terribly good. But so I like in, to, in order to encourage people, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter how good the drawings are because you still have that process of of looking and making a record of something. So this was this was a little while after Uncle Jeff had had had, had died, and every time he went out for a walk, he, he loved walking. He would he would find a stone he really liked and bring it bring it back. And there was a collection of they had a big collection of the stones in the in the in the garden, and they kept kept a um, Mary kept a, a collection of the stones he brought back from from his walks in a glass vase. So I just thought that was really lovely because it, like stones are such ordinary things because they're all over the place, but it, it's, it was made into something like a really precious um, memorial and memory of, um, of Uncle Jeff. So that's, that's why I wanted to do that. Well, I think you, you brought up something so important when you said that one of the things that happens when you begin drawing like this is you, you have to learn to really look, right? You have to learn to really see. I mean, to me, that's the whole, the making of an artist is the learning to see. Yes. It's not so much well, whether you have, you know, people always say, oh, this person has a you know gift or this person is talented. It's, that's not really it. It's can you really see? Yes. So the more time you spend with a sketchbook and, yes. and drawing or thinking about how you would draw something, you have to really begin to see. Yes, because what happens even if you just take a if you have the most beautiful photograph in the world and you just want to paint a painting of it. Yes. When you actually start trying to paint this beautiful photograph, you discover there's all kinds of problems there. There's all kinds of snakes in that pile that you have to figure out before you can make a painting that will be beautiful. Yes. Because in the photograph, you don't notice the problems, but in a painting, they become very obvious and it's hard to explain why I'd have to show you a photograph sometime and take this apart, but, but that's the way the world works. So seeing uh, as one of my viewers named Matthew, who's also been on the show a few times, he's a philosopher too. He's the one I talked with about Iris Murdoch. Um, oh, right. He says, 
and he might have been quoting somebody else, but he said, in a way, seeing gathers. So seeing is taking all these disparate elements that are out there in front of us and makes sense of them, gathers them in our mind into a coherent whole. So when you're looking at this vase full of rocks, you have to be thinking, you know, what is it that makes glass look like glass? What is it that makes a rock look like a rock? How are the rocks differentiated from the glass? And you're thinking about all that while you're drawing it, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're you're looking deeply into the nature of reality itself in a way that you don't really when you take a photograph. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not it's not a, it's not a good drawing, but it's still nonetheless it's 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 yeah, it precisely that you have to sort of think about because the, the rocks that the rocks that you know that you can see straight through. Mm -hmm. It looked different through the different through the glass. I, mean, I just did a little swivel there at the side, but it's, a, it's more in a sense it's more like a diagram than a than, than, than a drawing. But, mm -hmm. but going back to um, going back to that video that you showed of the AI creativity, and you'd mm -hmm. said um, I've forgotten his name, but you'd said that the, the person showing it had said that AI is more creative than us. Yes, which I, I don't think is is true. But 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 what you said about learning to see is. It's a creativity is not it's not drawn out of people, is it? So you you don't you don't start off by assuming that that people are good at maths. You teach them maths, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you teach them. And so uh -huh. so likewise, people can people can be taught can be can be taught how to see and practice. Practice, practice, practice. Actually, oh, ab absolutely. I never painted a thing until I was fifty years old. And um, and even when I first started painting, I just tried to paint photographs. There wasn't a creative bone in my body. Right. Yes, yes. But when I took that class, it cracked me open and yes. out spilled all this stuff that I never knew was in there. So yes, 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 you can teach creativity, and I think it's there. He he made the state. He made some statement in that in that uh, TED talk that. Creativity is some special thing that only a few people have. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, everybody can be creative, every single human being. And in fact, they need to be because they have something they need to share with the world for the world to be made complete. Um, yes, yes. I don't, but yeah. I, I, yeah. And I suppose the attitude that only a few people have creativity is partly because creativity is crushed out of so many people. Yes. So, so, so one of the, I think the, the bigger danger from AI. It's not just the idea that AI might be more creative than us. One of the things that's going on is that people are encouraged to um, react really quickly and to, and to use computing to do stuff that they could have done themselves. And, and there's, there's, I think there's more of a risk that it's, you can, obviously you can, as you've shown by using um, Adobe Photoshop, you can use it as part of your creative process. You can use it as a tool like that. But I think it's, it's, it's also a real danger but we could, but we could um, allow our own, uh, our own ways of, oh, our own potential to atrophy. Oh, in the same sort of, in the same sort of way as, you know, you you see uh, tourists at places. It sounds so judgmental, but it's hard not to be. Tourists at places just going around, click, 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 selfie, selfie, selfie. Um, it's interesting, actually. Actually, I mean, actually, in comparison with the sort of like the selfie phenomenon. But all of these, all of these, if you're doing a drawing. You're in the picture anyway. You're in the picture because it's your drawing and because you've you've seen it. So that's like a, a kind of like a reverse selfie, maybe. That's like that's a, such a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, especially <laughs> last night, I was listening to um, Matthew and Michael, a couple of guys that have been on my channel before, and and another guy named Kalia, and they're talking about something called the CT. CMTU, CTMU, it's some sort of new theory of everything. Oh, right. Yeah, and uh, I don't remember what you just said that made me think about that talk of theirs, but I lost my thread. Okay. Uh, okay. What you said made me think about their talk. And um, I was talking about drawing as a reverse, as being like a reverse selfie. A reverse selfie, yes. You're in the picture. Yes. Because you're drawing it. Yes, they were yes. talking about, they're having this long discussion about ultimate reality. And can you conceive of a reality 
in which not everything is contained in the reality, but there is something outside of that ultimate reality. Oh, right. <laughs> so it made me think about that. But anyway, yeah. it was a great conversation. A little bit above my pay grade, but very interesting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, this so has been this has been fantastic, Paula. I think we need to do another one of these um, because I would like to just ha I would just love to have you talk sometime about just the whole issue of ethics and moral knowledge and things like that because I can tell you have a deep deep understanding that goes way beyond anything that I've ever looked at, and uh, I think it would make a great conversation. I know. You also have a job, so you work and you teach, and so your time is is limited. But if you ever do have the time and you'd like to come back, yeah, I would love to have a conversation with you. That would be that would be really that would be really great. Maybe uh, maybe in a, a you know a month or two that would be that would be really lovely. I've, I've really really enjoyed talking to you. It's so it's so interesting to compare uh, the different art and you know different ways of doing it. But yeah, the way in which you produce all those pictures is so inspiring. But uh, well, and, and on the other hand, I really wish that I had your capacity to illustrate because I love what you did with the, the Descartes thing. I mean, oh, thanks. I just thought that was off the hook creative. Um, just even the, the way that you thought about the, the, um, the, the honeycomb and use that as your framing for each page. I mean, it, you, you think like a children's book illustrator, you know, and yet it's so many levels above a children's book because it, it's really the reaching towards the highest of our cognitive capacity to try to understand a, a content like that. And, but the, the drawings just illuminated the ideas in such a great way, so. Thank you so much, thanks. Yeah. So I look forward to our next get together in a couple of months. Me and too. in the meantime, have a wonderful life. <laughs> and you too. Yes, yes. Great to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks, Paula. You make me smile. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.